Hi everybody, Professor Feist here. What I want to talk about today is a little bit of John Locke. Well, some stage setting actually for Locke because in this video I'm not really going to get too much into John Locke, a little bit at the end, but I'm going to start with, as I said, stage setting. That is, I'm going to look at a couple of very important thinkers that were a little bit before and at the same time concurrent with Locke. Descartes and Newton. Now, René Descartes is a very famous philosopher. You've probably heard of him. He's the, uh, I think, therefore I am guy. Isaac Newton, very famous physicist, probably next to Einstein, one of the most famous physicists of all time. And he's the fellow with, uh, uh, with, who got hit by the apple, according to the story, um, and wrote up the famous theory of, of gravitation, Newton's laws. So no doubt you've encountered those in some of your travels. Well, let's look first at Descartes, René Descartes, often called the father of modern philosophy and of course, as I said, this famous, probably the most famous statement in all of philosophy, I think therefore I am. You probably even see it in the Latin version, cogito ergo sum. Everyone's heard it, lots of people have said it, but what does it really mean and why do we call this man, René Descartes, the father, father of modern philosophy. These questions are, in a sense, interconnected. Well, let's look back a little bit before Descartes. As a matter of fact, let's just talk in a, in a broad brushstroke about the history of philosophy before Descartes, with respect to one notion, the notion of the human mind. Before Descartes, not everybody, but certainly most philosophers saw the mind as this passive, receptive and recorder of information. Descartes was someone who started to worry a little bit more about how the mind actually recorded this information. Well, but if you think, if you go back and use your imagination, you go back in time and think about how people fit into their world before our current uh, technologically advanced society, you can see why people would have thought the mind is very passive. Think about it this way. We're very used to thinking like this. The actions and the things that you do can have global effects. We are long used to thinking that if humans are not careful, they could start a war that could lead to the use of certain kinds of weapons like nuclear weapons or biological weapons that could destroy all life on the planet. We're very used to thinking about that. So it's almost, it's almost a commonplace. Think about how much power is contained in that idea. Namely, that we humans could actually destroy the entire world. For the ancient Greeks, that power was reserved only for the gods. Humans couldn't do that. Think about it, uh, another way that we think about destroying the world, global warming. We don't even have to resort to war. Just simple, uh, everyday things that we do seems like driving our cars, seems to be contributing uh, well, it's not seems to, it is contributing on a massive level to the changing of the weather. We actually influence the weather. So it's not true to say that, you know, nobody ever does anything about the weather. It's true, we're doing all kinds of things, but they're, they're terrible things. But my point is, is that long ago, this kind of idea that humans could have this kind of power to influence everything would have thought, no, 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 that you're trying to play God. That's what gods or the God or God does is to influence the world like this. So it's not hard to see why philosophers thought the mind was passive, receptive and a recorder of information. So with this passive uh, uh, view of the mind, uh, uh, philosophers uh, wrote about it and used certain kinds of metaphors. The mind is like wax. Plato used this as a possible model of the mind. Descartes, as we'll see, likes to use wax in his discussions. Um, but this notion of the mind as wax is, is important because when you have the notion of the mind as wax being stamped by the world and getting an impression of the world, this is why we talk about the mind getting impressions, is the world is like a stamp. It just impresses itself and gives a shape to the mind. Now if you look at that, at that picture, you see there's a, there's a correspondence there. The little image that's on the stamp and the impression on the wax, it's the same image. So the mind was passive, receptive, and it recorded information very accurately. 
In other words, the mind just sort of read uh, the world. It just read it like a text. It read it right as reality. No problem there. The mind just simply recorded information coming in. It just reads the world as it really is. This is a kind of realism. So the mind is the wax, the world is the stamp, and knowledge can be thought of as the wax impression. Now, Descartes uh, was very concerned uh, about this image, this passive image of the mind, because there were a lot of other things going on at the time. I mentioned already that humans have vast amounts of technological power at their fingertips. Well, when Descartes was living in 1596 to 1650, it was a very complex and dynamic time in France and in Europe in general. There were religious wars in France. The Catholics and the Huguenots were fighting. There was a scientific revolution going on. Descartes was part of that. Descartes saw himself more as a mathematician and a scientist than always a philosopher. Um, but the thing in the scientific revolution that was important is that the world was thought to be composed of particles in motion. So we have a different notion of how the mind relates to the world than in the ancients and the medievals. The ancient and the medievals, again, thought that the mind just picked up patterns like wax picks up an impression. Now we're shifting to the mind as getting its information scattered through these particles and putting it back together. So it's not as clear as just taking an image from the world. It's going to be more complicated. In other words, the mind is going to be much more active than just being a passive slab of wax that's stamped by the world. There's a breakdown in Descartes' time. Well, it occurred before him, but it's continuing to break down. That is the medieval theology and philosophy that had been combined so nicely by, the, by people like uh, St. Thomas Aquinas, who had managed to put Aristotelian, that is the thought of Aristotle, together with the thought uh, uh, of the Catholic Church's tradition. So religion and science had been nicely put together. Religion and philosophy had been put, put together into this large synthesis while this was breaking down as well. And last but definitely not least is the rise of skepticism. Skepticism is a very complex topic, but basically the skeptic does not say anything more than I do not know whether or not there is real knowledge. So the skeptic stands back and here she says, is there knowledge? I don't know. Descartes is trying to fight against that. So that little cogito ergo sum and being the father of modern philosophy is a product of all these kinds of things that are going on in the time of, uh, of, of Descartes' life, the complexities of France, and of course the history of philosophy as well and this passive notion of the mind. It's all about to be overturned. Now, Descartes represents what we now call rationalism. There's lots of different ways to define this term rationalism, and historians and scholars and philosophers will certainly disagree. But the one thing that rationalism really stresses is that when we learn about the world, yes, we, we, we use these, there's no question. Um, we use our five senses all the time, listed there. Um, but the senses are something that we use only in a way to kind of get around the world. True knowledge, really knowledge itself, the important stuff, is really the product of a, a, a vision that the mind has, a special kind of insight. The mind's eye, so to speak. Now, the real source of, uh, of knowledge and truth being the mind, how does that look in sort of an everyday kind of example? Well, I'm going to pull this one out. The notion of a bent stick in water. You've no, no doubt you've all seen something like this. You see a cup with a straw in it, and you see the, uh, uh, you know, not a stick or a straw, uh, and you see that it's bent. And notice the term I use. You see that it is bent. So if you just went on your senses, that is looking, in this case your visual, senses, uh, you would see that, well, look, it's, it's bent. You would, you would make a, a certain claim about the way the world is. But, of course, we know that that's not truly bent, so we make a separation, we make a distinction between appearance and reality. The senses give us an appearance, but our mind, when we really think about it, comes up with the explanation that the senses are deceiving us. 
The senses are giving us an appearance, but the mind is what will truly capture what is behind the appearance, namely the mind will caption, capture reality. And that's a very important sort of notion, is that, that the mind can see into uh, the world in a way that the senses cannot. Now, I want to take this one step further and look at a famous thought experiment that Descartes uh, conducted many years ago as he was sitting in his study on a cold winter night and contemplating some philosophical notions about how the mind comes to know the world. Well, this is referred to as Descartes' wax experiment. Well, let's start off. Notice the wax. The wax at first is hard. It has, as Descartes said, you, you can touch it, you can feel it, 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 it resists, it's, it's got a hardness to it, you can knock on it, it makes a noise, it has a certain scent, all kinds of properties. Now, if Descartes says, if I take this wax and move it over to the fireplace, I'm going to notice something happens. It's going to change. What's going to happen? Well, when, uh, uh, when I take it over to the fireplace, it's going to start melting. The color, in this case, it will start to lose it. It will lose this whitish color and become translucent, eventually quite transparent. It loses its shape. It may even lose its smell. All these properties, these sense properties, the, the properties that I say, oh, they were there via my senses, they will all, all start to disappear. So Descartes says, well, what is this wax at the end of it all? The sense properties are gone. So what's the wax? Well, he said something like this. He said the, the wax in the end is just something that is extended in space and it's flexible. It can, it's malleable. It can change. So all those other properties like the smell and stuff, we can get rid of all those. Those aren't really important. But the real essence, the real inside nature of the wax, that's really what we mean by a term like essence, that is what Descartes said, that's flexible extension. And how do you understand flexible extension? Well, Descartes said, clearly, you're not going to see it because you, all you see are sense properties. You can't imagine it because in order to use your imagination, you have to take elements from your experience, right? If you imagine stuff, you're drawing on your memories and your memories are products of sense experience. Kind of like when I imagine a unicorn. I take a memory of a horse and a memory of a horn and my imagination puts them together. And bang, I imagine a unicorn. You can't imagine, you can't see the notion of flexible extension, but as Descartes says, you can understand it. So this notion of seeing directly into reality is an old philosophical view. You can find it in the medievals. And of course, it, it was very important to Plato was one of the key elements of his uh, understanding of the world. Now, one of the other things that Descartes talks about that's very important, and it ties into his wax experiment, is this. He says, well, now that I figured out what the wax is, this flexible extension, I'm going to ask, what is my self? What is my inner self? Descartes asks this question, and in similar ways, he rules out the senses because you can't see yourself, you see your body, but you don't see a self. You can't imagine a self for the same reasons why you can't imagine flexible extension, because all, your, all the ideas that come to you through your imagination, they are products of sense experience. But yet, we have this understanding that we do have a self. How do we get it? Descartes says, well, it's a lot like the way we understand the nature of things in the external world. So there's a nice symmetry here. I understand the essence of the wax through my grasping of this notion of flexible extension, and I understand the nature of myself, the essence of myself, through this internal kind of gra grasping, introspection, a direct introspection. All right, so as I said, uh, all these senses won't help you. You can't see it. You can't imagine it. And what would it look like? Well, it's a pure rational grasping of yourself, a pure act of the mind, a direct act of introspection. So Descartes, for our purposes here, his, his main point is you have a direct insight into the world, that is, through thi into things and the self, and the self for Descartes was a special kind of substance, a special kind of thing, namely it was a thinking thing. 
This is all a very nice and neat organization. It was a new way of looking at things in many ways. Certainly drew on the tradition as well, not completely new. And so in this focus on the mind and how it knows things is a key reason why we call Descartes the father of modern philosophy. The study of the mind and how it knows things is often referred to as epistemology. So Descartes took philosophy and emphasized epistemology. Again, more so than, than the medievals did, more so than the ancients, and that's why we often call him the father of modern philosophy. And this notion of cogito ergo sum, I think therefore I am, the importance of that is that Descartes builds all of his philosophical thinking upon that fundamental notion that once skepticism is allowed to work, it'll get rid of all the sense uh, properties that you think you know, all the imagination, those could all be fictions, those could all be wrong. But the mind with its direct insight, its direct introspection into the self, I think therefore I am, that's the foundation that we can build true knowledge and escape from the dangers of things like skepticism. So, as I said, all nice and neat and tidy, but uh, Isaac Newton's coming and that's about to change everything. So, our second figure that's important to Locke, in addition to Descartes, is Isaac Newton. He is a contemporary of Locke's. As a matter of fact, Newton was about seven, seven years old when uh, Descartes died. Uh, so, he was alive for a little while, Descartes, didn't know Descartes, but Newton reacted to Descartes' work. And Newton published probably one of the most important works in the history of science, the Principia Mathematica in 1687. And in this, he details his famous theory of gravitation, amongst other things. And of course, Newton never clearly stated what gravity was. He preferred to leave that issue to the side. He preferred to simply say, look, gravity is an attractive force. I'm not quite sure exactly what kind of attractive force, but I can tell you how it works. We can do calculations, I can tell you how much things pull on other things and how they're going to move. So the accurate mathematical detail of how things work, that's what's important to Newton. Not to look inside, like Descartes was talking about, and try and determine the essence of gravity. Newton said, we really can't figure that out. He actually did look at it in more of his theological works. Uh, and related it to the notion of God. But for his science, Descartes, or, or Newton said, forget it, we can't do what Descartes did. We can only do the mathematics describing how things would work. So it comes as no surprise that Newton thought that Descartes' idea of matter as flexible extension, he thought it was absolutely nonsense. It's not a workable concept. You cannot use it in mathematics. Uh, and so we should jettison it from physics. The important point here, though, is that Newton did not really go after Descartes in the sense of going through all Descartes' arguments, you know, argument by argument and refuting them. He didn't. He proposed a totally different way of looking at things, and the key thing is that Newton's physics, it won. It was just far more successful in, in the arena of experiment than Descartes ever was. So the main result is that science, it, it, and Newton didn't clearly separate science and philosophy, um, science just works with our five senses and our reasoning. There's no special kind of perception like the mind's eye or the understanding. Again, we got to go back to the basics. We use our regular five senses and our reasoning, and that's how we should construct our scientific systems. And, and that, of course, produced uh, Newton's system, which was, as I said, extremely successful and far more successful uh, than Descartes. So it's not surprising that Descartes' physics only lasted a little while and Newton's came on the scene and the textbooks, all of Descartes' textbooks on physics were basically thrown out and Newton's Principia was brought in. Finally, we've got a little bit of a background to John Locke. We've looked a little bit at Descartes and his view of the world. We've looked a little bit at Newton and his view of the world. And now we turn to John Locke, British philosopher. John Locke was about uh, 12 years old when Newton was born, and the two actually did know each other and correspond with each other. Locke was familiar with Newton's work, 
pretty well all academics of all stripes were at the time. Newton actually was kind of the rock star of his day. He's a very famous man. People consulted him on all kinds of things in addition to science. Newton worked uh, for the government and did all kinds of things. Highly respected figure. Locke said that in the end, I'm just an under-laborer. Locke compared himself to an under-laborer in that the philosopher's job, like an under-laborer, was to clean up. The under-laborer sweeps things away so that, you know, the sidewalk can be used, gets rubbish and debris out of the way. Locke said that's a lot what the philosopher does. It gets rid, the philosopher gets rid of terms and concepts that are useless, that have no foundation, or cleans up the ones that maybe are useful and makes them more useful. So the philosopher is at the service uh, of the scientist. So Locke agreed that, uh, with Newton that there was no special kind of insight into the world. No, we just go through our senses. We, can, we reason, of course, but reason runs on the information that's given uh, by the five senses. Locke's work, An Essay Concerning Human Understanding, appears in 1689 couple of years after Newton's great work in science, the Principia. And this work of Locke's, the essay, uh, is one of the great works in the history uh, of, of Western philosophy. It exerts an enormous influence on philosophers and is continually studied for the next several centuries. And you couldn't keep up with the publications on, uh, of scholars writing about Locke's work uh, today. It generates still a lot of interest. Voltaire, for instance, the great French thinker, praised it at the same time as denigrating, you know, his fellow Frenchman Descartes. Now, Locke says that he is following what he calls the plain, the historical plain method. Basically, if you have an idea of something, that isn't, and I'll use idea in a, in a simple way here, just you have something before the mind like an image. So if you have an idea of something like the idea of a dog or a unicorn, uh, the method, this historical plane method, is to try and trace the history of that idea. Try to trace it back so that all of its component parts can be traced back to experiences. If you cannot locate, Locke says, the components or the idea in experience, then chance are, chances are that idea itself is probably some kind of fiction. It's probably made up. Uh, and in that sense, you should be aware of it. That might be an example of one of those concepts or ideas that should be broomed out with, uh, uh, with other ideas because they're getting in the way of doing proper science. So the basic picture of uh, uh, Locke's approach, it goes like this. Uh, the ideas are whatever is before the mind when it thinks, and ideas in the mind result from the interaction of the body, right? just the physical body, your, your senses, with the world. So knowledge then is going to be these ideas <clears throat> plus reasoning. So there's no innate ideas, uh, things like that. You're not born stamped with things like Descartes thought we were stamped, for instance, with the notion of God. Like Dar Locke says no. Locke thought you could prove the existence of God. He had no problems with that. But he just said it's not stamped in your mind. Your mind doesn't really work like that. So this is the basic view that we have, and you've no doubt heard this little Latin expression, of a tabula rasa. For Locke, the mind is kind of like a blank slate. It gets action from, it receives action from the world, impressions from the world, and it organizes them. So it harkens back to uh, uh, the traditional notion of the wax tablet, but with more of an active process to it, and of course, a different view than the medievals and the ancients because now we have that scientific view of the world being composed of particles zooming around and it becomes more complex for the mind to build up a picture of the world than a simple stamping. But the key idea is that Locke thought we really just work with ideas and reasoning, nothing innate and certainly no special insight into things. As Newton said, ideas, reasoning, that's how we build our scientific structures. So the main point for Locke, which is going to be important for us, is there's a major shift in the approach to the world. The mind is at a distance from the world. It does get its information from the world in this scientific type of a framework through the particles. It has an action upon those to structure those and organize those, those, that information coming from the world in order to try and create a picture of the world. But 
at the end of it all, the mind does not have a special insight like Descartes and Plato thought we had. No special insight into the world. We simply go back and we look at the senses and we reason with them. So, when we ask questions now, what is the self, we don't have as Descartes would say, this direct introspection. So now for Locke, he's got a problem on his hands. He doesn't have this nice, neat, tidy way of pointing out the self. And think of it this way. If you can't see the self and you have to construct it in some way, how are you going to be sure that you've got this notion of a self? How are you going to be sure you have one? And how are you going to be sure that the self that you're talking about now is the same self that you thought you were yesterday, or when you're a child, or that the, that's the self you are now will be the same self as in the future. So what I want to Im impress upon you is that as the background, as the ideas in philosophy and science change, the problems themselves will look different. The problem of the self was easy for Descartes. He had the tool of direct introspection. Bang, you just look at you see yourself. Locke doesn't have that tool anymore, so the question is going to become much more difficult to solve. But we'll look at that later. Thank you.